Learning methods, it's an exploration of learning, but it's available to a variety of situations, not just music. Um, <clears throat> it's relatable to Alexander Technique in the sense that we are navigating the system, like the human system, um, but and the thing that makes learning methods a little more unique is that it tries to get to the root of the cause. So typically, people are trying to, if um, a musician is experiencing tension anywhere, we usually try and go straight to fixing it and see what we could do to relieve the tension. Um, and whereas with learning methods, we ask, well, why does that make sense that, you'll be, that you're experiencing some tension right now? So it's a different approach to it. Um, I really wanted to talk about learning methods for my capstone because um, I have experienced it and I've been teaching with it now for about three years as with uh, private voice teaching, cello and piano, and when I had a community choir for a little while there. And I have not come across um, a learning approach that addresses autonomy, creative thinking, anxieties, talks about the human system and addresses physical discomfort um, as clearly as I've experienced it with learning methods. Um, so to give you just an idea of the schedule here, um, I'm going to take you through, about, instead of taking you through the website and being like, you know, this is the about page, instead I'm going to take you guys through like a very quick 15 minutes sort of idea of how I usually run a private lesson with my students. Um, and then uh, you'll have a few minutes to explore the website and then we'll open up to questions. Um, so the first book that's being passed around um, is from, if anyone here is familiar with, <laughs> thank you Kelly, uh, familiar with Voice Care Network, it comes from that program and um, it's a voice education program in Minnesota. I did a few summers ago, so there's, they talk about things like vocal anatomy, conducting, voice teaching, um, all kinds of things like that, and it's very interrelated to this kind of stuff. So that's a textbook from that. A lot of my sources are, like, throughout the website are from that stuff, so that's just for you guys to browse through if you want. And then this um, is a textbook that David Borman, the creator of Learning Methods, um, wrote. And what it is, is it's actually a series of drawings of anatomy that he drew. He went to Guelph and like looked at, like went into like the cadavers and studied and sat in and like drew everything to get like a understanding of the system as like a sort of reference for people with the language that he uses. So that's also something for you guys to check out if you want. So, you might want to um, scoot your laptops aside and stuff. We're going to start sitting. You can stay as you are, um, but we're going to stand up in a second. So, diving right into like the sort of mini voice lesson here. Usually, what I do with my students sometimes, especially if I sense that like they're coming in from a busy day or something, I'll have us do a bit of like maybe one or two minutes of just informal meditation. So everybody close your eyes. And listen to the sounds in the space. And there's no need to like them or dislike them. Simply notice the sounds as they are. Now notice the sense of the earth coming up to support you. The feeling of your chair, the ground. And consider what is my current state of being right now? Am I excited, anxious, hungry? Given a name to your state of being right now, such as cheerful, where do you feel that? And whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes and come back into the space. And 
I will usually do it with them. And one of the main things that I really like to do this is to put on the table how does my current state of being, or how might my current state of being impact today's lesson, both for me as the teacher and for the student. What are we bringing into the space that day? Um, and it's a great way to sort of settle into the space, meet each other as we are, and go from there. Um, and then usually what we do next is we'll go into vocal warm-ups. Um, we usually I'll ask them if they sung that day or not, and then we'll kind of go from there how much we're going to get into vocal warm-ups. So um, I think this would be best done if everybody stood. So. Yeah. All right, so the first, first warm-up I usually do with them is I call like puppy whimper. Usually I have like a couple seven-year-olds and they're like, I want to do horsey whimper. And I'm like, sure, by all means. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so the first one for that is it's just, um, it's a soft. <laughs> so what you're doing is you kind of tell them, pretend you're a puppy who's trying to get a treat or you're trying to come inside and it's cold outside. <laughs> And then usually from there, I'll go to roller coaster sounds. So you just start off low and. And I'll take the time to explain to them that the whole purpose of that is that it's just gently stretching the vocal folds to get it nice and lengthened, warmed up for any high register. A lot of warm ups usually are done in like triads and stuff, and there's like a lot of, you know, Ah, uh, kind of going down, there's like, sometimes people, the higher up it goes, you get worried about getting that fifth in the triad. So that's just a gentle way to wake up the upper register. And I'll, I'll explain that with them, we'll talk about it. Um, and then the next one is kind of like, depending on whatever one resonates with them, or whatever one they feel like using, I like gorilla noises, but it's essentially the same thing, just with lower. So you make like gorilla noises, you just go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, 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 stuff like that. Um, and then we'll go into lip trills or rolled R's, depending on what people prefer. Um, and I usually do that as a fifth. So, and you can either use that. You guys know to go up a semitone, down a semitone. However, there's a lot of different variations to it. I'm a big fan of that one because it really awakens um, breath flow, gets that going, and especially for middle to like upper registers, maybe some people aren't aware of how much air is required um, to make that sound. So it's a good way to sort of map out where I need more energy and where other notes maybe are a little easier for me. Um, and then this one, um, I just call them <laughs> exclamations. I wasn't quite sure what else to call them. But it's just a thing of like back and forth that we'll do sometimes. So just like repeat after me. Wow. 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 No. No. Really? Really? You don't say. You don't say. Wait. Wait. Stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll do that. We'll go back and forth maybe. It's just a nice way to... Um, be silly together for them to have a little bit of low pressure, like creativity go on. Um, and it's also a way to talk about how the voice expresses in everyday conversation, how we access that, and to try and channel that in either speaking or music making. Um, so usually we'll do those things. Those are kind of like some of my go-to warm-ups that I like to do. Um, sometimes we'll do physical warm-ups, so, um, and this is where I take an opportunity to talk about um, either perspectives or misconceptions about the human structure. So in the sense um, that I'll talk about, okay, so pretend you have a bed spring in your hand, spring mattress, and if you try and push down on that spring or that coil, what does it want to do? Goes back up. If you take the same spring and you try and pull on it, what does it want to do? Go back to its original state. So that is an analogy in the sense that we are a pre-sprung springy system that if we are 
hunched or if we're looking at our music or anything, the system naturally wants to go back into its pre-spine sporty self. If we are trying to be a good chorister and we want to have open chest, you know, great posture, all those things that we've been taught when we were eight, we want to go back into our natural coordination so that we're open and available. So that's something that we'll check in with every now and then throughout the lesson. Um, another thing we'll talk about, um, so we talk about joints. So by that I mean there's one joint at the top of the spine and that actually it's where your spine ends and it's actually behind the ears. Um, a lot of people think it's more so at the bottom of the neck and this will be because we're on a time crunch, I'm like just zooming through this, but usually I'll ask them where they think it is and uh, we'll kind of take it a little more apart from there. But it's behind the ears. And it's like located like higher than most people think. And so a way to kind of play around with that is we say draw like draw a picture with your nose. So do that. And notice that that is where the joint or the hinge is coming from. That sort of area there. Um, we'll also talk about arm joints. So by that, um, a lot of teachers like to do like shoulder rolls and stuff. But the thing that I say to my students is, when is the only time? when you raise your shoulders or roll your shoulders. So when you go, no, uh, it's a defense, it's a tense defense thing. The system never usually normally does that unless it's in this kind of a situation. So it doesn't quite, to me at this point, make sense to use it as a warm up in a voice lesson. So what we do instead is we just reach up, scratch somebody's back, actually scratch their back, if they consent, if they're okay with it. Oh, that's so sad. Scratch somebody else's back. Scratch your own shoulder. Scratch your other shoulder. Point to the exit sign. I don't know. Point to your speaker. Uh, point to that doorway. Point to somebody's shoes. Point to your nose. Notice that all of these instructions I'm giving to people are giving are an external source. So there's a difference of coordination between, you know, raise your arm or extend your arm out compared to point to that door. And I'll get to a little bit more of that later in a second. But um, next we'll talk about hip joints. So again, usually I'll ask them, where do you think the hip joint is? Usually I get something like around here is where people think it is. It's actually lower than most people think it is. It's where your hip meets your leg. When you're, so if you bend your leg, all we're gonna do is we're gonna pretend that we're squishing a grape with our foot. And that is where the hip joint is. It's a lot lower than people think it is. And so usually what I'll have students do is I'll have them go back and forth between our newly registered hip joint and what they thought their previous hip joint was, which was up here. Now try and squish a grape with that by moving from there. And now go back. Feel free to grab a seat on your chairs. Again, we're going to talk about sit bones. And again, usually I'll ask them where do you think your sit bones are, and they usually will point to their butt, which makes sense. But it's actually a little further down than we think it is. Kind of similar to like where the hip joint is. If you feel, if you kind of like rock around in your chair, or sometimes I have them put like your hands under your butts, and you feel for like the two sit bones, it's actually further down. On, almost feels like it's on your leg or your thigh to some people. Is that an actual medical term? Yeah. Where's the book? Someone find the yeah. Um So that's a uh, something to play around with if your students sit. You know, am I over my sit bones? Am I in my full support? Or am I sitting on my spine? When you lean back, it causes the spine to curve. You're no longer in a pre-sprung self state of being. So that's something that we like to play around with. And I don't give them all of this right on the get-go. I'll kind of just like drop it in here and there on lessons at a time. Um, so going on to rep, this is kind of my like order that I like to do things in when we're learning a piece. Um, so I'll have them sing or perform it as many times as they want because I don't know about you guys, from what I've heard there's a, a lot of pressure when you see your like 
music teacher and you've been working on it all week and then you play it for them once and you mess up that part and you're like, that never happened at home. And that's not necessarily a fair way to be able to show what it is that like you were able to work on that week because there's often a lot of pressure. So they'll sing something, they'll perform for me and I'll say, thank you, do you want to do it again? And we'll just go until they feel like they're, they're happy with what they played. Um, from there, I'll ask them, before I say anything, I'll say, how do you think you did? And I usually get, good. And I say, okay, give me more than good. <laughs> and I'll ask them for more details. I ask usually for like, tell me three things that you thought you liked about your plan. And then I'll say, what are some things that um, you think that you could improve on? Um, and um, then I'll also ask them, if they give me something that they think we could improve and I'll say, great, how do you want to tackle that? And it's very much a collaboration between the two of us and um, my goal basically is for them to not need me. So I want them to be able to have the skills, thought process that we do together so that when they're at home and they're practicing, they don't say, well, I, I couldn't do it, it was too hard, or I didn't know, like, I was waiting for lessons this week to tackle this section. I want to be able to provide them with the tools to be able to do it themselves. Um, if they have maybe like an audition or like a huge performance coming up, then maybe that can be an opportunity where you direct it a little more. Um, but if it's not necessary, why not have a collaborative process with that? Um, so, basically there's two big, I wanna say like subcategories of this stuff that typically I focus on for things that come up in lessons. One is our perspective or misconception of the human system, which we've talked about a little bit already. But basically, the human system, the body, is an adaptive coordinating system that adapts to our intentions. And by that, I mean that there's 95% of our actions are um, created subconsciously and 5% is conscious. And so it's, um, coordination is often talked about in a thing as like mind-body as two as things that are two separate things. But the purpose of learning methods by this is that you are always up in perfect coordination of whatever it is that you're up to, or whatever it is that you're thinking about right now. So one example that's more of like a go-to one is like if a vocalist performing is trying to connect with the audience and they're like leaning forward. Is this in your best support to be singing this way right now? And if not, what's a different way that we can re-examine that in a way that could be connecting with the audience that doesn't involve um, the system not being in an optimal coordination for singing. Um, so I've kind of got a little thing here. Um, we talk about attention. By that we mean whatever it is that you are focusing on, whatever your attention is on. Um, and a lot of people say, oh, sorry, I was spaced out, or, oh, I'm no, sorry, I wasn't listening. It's not that you were spaced out, it's that your attention was somewhere else, and that coordinated wherever it was that you were up to. Intention is more your movement coordination. So that's sort of the example that I meant with like the leaning forward thing. If your intention is to connect with the audience, that's how the system's going to coordinate itself. It's not that you chose to lean forward, it's the subconscious coordination. Um, I think for the interest of time, I'm going to skip lightness and strength for now. Um, and we can maybe come back to that later. Um, but the last little bit is performance anxiety. Um, and this one, um, there's kind of like three bit, like sub aspects of it that I like to look at. So the first one is language. Usually, um, in my experience, if people are nervous, they'll say something like, you know, I'm, I'm scared I'm not going to be good enough. Good enough at what? Good enough to, like, for who? If you ask questions, usually when people express um, thoughts of concern, they don't finish their sentence. So the power of just asking why and what until they possibly can't answer either of those questions anymore is extremely helpful with this kind of stuff. Um, the other question, or uh, this next category is not good enough, which is a common perspective that uh, music students have of themselves. Not good enough for whom? To whose standards? 
Um, what are your expectations? Are they accurate to the, your current reality? I have a lot of voice students who say, you know, well, I can't sing that high, or we'll sing through it, and they'll say, well, it wasn't very good. Well, should it be perfect on the first time we sing it through? What are your expectations? Kind of breaking it down like that. Um, and then criteria. Talking about what did I value about my presentation or the, my performance. The other thing, too, is a big one, is that a lot of the times we think about an audience or a group of people as one entity. They loved it, they hated it, they, it's as if everyone has the same opinion. But thinking about criteria allows us to open up the dialogue